welcome to the show. This is the Goodwin Podcast, and I am Nico Lapalusa. I'll be your host today, and you know, maybe many days moving forward. Happy to be alive. Thank you for my life. Thank you for your life. Thank you for the time that we're about to spend together. Man, there really is no time like the present. Hmm? Is this too positive to start off? Oh no, that's how the hero's journey goes. For those not familiar with the hero's journey, you are familiar with the hero's journey. And so we're done. For those not familiar with the hero's journey, you already are familiar with the hero's journey. And so we're done. This has been the show. Thank you. Um, the hero's journey. Every story has started the, is the same story. Every story is the epic of Gilgamesh. Every story is the story of Jesus. Every, every story is the story of you, is the story of a day, a lifetime. Every small wave is just a representation of the larger waves. Every microcosm is a reflection of the macro. So how the hero's journey starts is in the Shire. Grass is green. There's Mary, Pip, and there's just general cheer. People harvesting the crops, getting in touch with nature, water's flowing, it's clean, blue skies. And then life throws you something which sets you out on an adventure. There's a call to adventure, there's a call to action. So we're going to, so this, this podcast will be. A hero's, journey's, a hero's journey of sorts. And who's to say who's the hero? I, uh, who's the villain? Spoiler alert, it's you're both. You're both the hero and the villain. Because although I'll be saying things, you'll be experiencing things. Your own thoughts, your own forms. And no matter what I say, not no matter what. Oh, absolutes, huh? Absolutes. Real, really difficult Some sometimes, <laughs> these absolutes. You know, when you get in a fight with someone or you get in a, in a, in a dispute and they say, you always or you never... And here's an absolute, it's never always. And it's rarely never. No, actually it could be never. Some people that, some relationships have been in, like friendships otherwise. They never call. They never call. I guess they're not in a relationship then. I guess we're not in a friendship. So that that's voided. Anyway, geez, you can tell it's been a while since I've been back. The ramblings of a madman have returned. I am glad you're here. I am thankful to be able to to have the opportunity to do this, to share some moments with you, to collect my thoughts. There's been a lot going on. I mean, it's been 90 days about since my last podcast, and I know that. It's roughly 90 days because my last one was about being put on house arrest and I had an ankle monitor on. And now I'm very happy to report that I am once again a free man. And I would love to share some of the learnings of, uh, of house arrest, of being... Now look, this is never, this is never a sad story. This isn't a sad story story this is not the place you get sad stories i have i as far as house arrest goes i I have the most beautiful place to spend house arrest to me i love the tree i have land i have forest there's a creek you know there's a little streaming water um 
it's the summer, so there's sunshine, I can go outside. And furthermore, as life would uh, deliver me a blessing, I was given an opportunity to work at a like a beautiful restaurant. I live in a lake town. And um, by happenstance, I find I find a job posting on a bulletin board, and this is before I went into the house arrest thing. And um, bulletin board in a coffee shop. They're hiring. This restaurant's hiring. I know the restaurant. It's one of the best restaurants in the area. By location, the ambiance, and they also have high quality food and drinks. And I just threw an application out there. I threw my chemistry application, so I'm a chemist by trade. If you're just joining the show, I, that's that would be rare. But thank you. If this is your first time watching The Good Wind, uh, welcome. And also, you know, maybe watch an, another episode. No, don't stick around. We'll see where this. We'll see where this one goes. I notice that sometimes when I take a break from stuff like the guitar, or like jujitsu. When I come back, I'm actually better. It's almost like I need I need a break from stuff to fully learn something. It's like I'll it's it requires both. There's like this effort required, this fumbling and stumbling and, and in jujitsu's case getting my 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 tukus handed to me. And then there's been times that I've taken like three months, four months, six months off. I've been practicing for six years now. And there's been a couple years where I had to take longer stints off because chemo, of because of shoulder injury, whatever. And uh, you'd think that you would decline, you just fall off, you know. But there's some stuff that like settles into the neurons. There's some stuff that like settles into the the body, I guess after a break away from something. And I don't know how long, I, I've heard that learning basically is the struggle, the unknowing, and a good sleep. And that's learning. Andrew Huberman talks about it, like the acetylcholine in the struggle. If you're trying to learn something, there has to be a struggle. And then, um, and then, yeah, there's a the sleep helps it settle into the neurons. Anyways, I digress. I was given this position, basically, this manager position at this restaurant. It's the best job I could have asked for. It gave me a sense of, it got me out of the house. It gave me a sense of social life. I work with hundreds of people. It's a large restaurant. Um, And it's a conglomerate of multiple businesses. Anyway, truly a blessing. It helped the time really go by. It gave me people to actually talk with and, and engage with uh, customers and coworkers alike. But now I am free. Now I no longer have to do four breathalyzers a day. Now I have no curfew. And I'm free. And it's trippy. It's trippy looking back at, at what this experience has been. And if one trip, one crazy thing, for example, is I can still feel the ankle bracelet on my leg. Sometimes I reach down and like try to adjust it. It's not there. I have a ghost limb. I have a ghost ankle monitor. I'm sure that'll go away soon, but these it's been two, three days since I got the ankle monitor off. I still feel it sometimes. And I really just didn't like, it really changed a lot of like little things in my life. Like how I would sit, how I would cross my legs, how I'd walk, putting on socks, like getting into the shower. Like it's just a thing that was there. And I became, it's so weird how people become accustomed to stuff. It's so weird how accustomed to a prison again i don't want to be dramatic it's house arrest and and i got to be in a beautiful place and i got to have a good job outside of the house with plenty of social interaction about halfway through 
Um, not a sad story, but just commenting on the limitation of freedom that I, I did experience. It's like, if I, if I try, if I try hard, I can understand Stockholm syndrome a little bit upon reflection. Since, so upon like, if I'm being a hundred percent honest, there have been moments where I kind of have, this is crazy and it's, it's not true in this moment. So it's hard to say, but there's been a moment where I kind of missed the structure. Yo, and this was only 90 days. But this, I was on a very tight schedule. I had four breathalyzers a day, and that really orientated my days into these into these moments, like these these check ins. I had to be in my room blowing in a tube, and you wouldn't think that that was anything significant, uh, and it wasn't at the time. But what it did do was it organized my days into very succinct windows. And it gave me a sense of urgency. If I was doing something, if I was at work, I, uh, I'd i have to get home in a certain amount of time. So if I wanted to go for a swim in the lake, there was no hesitation. I'd get off work. I'd get into my, my swimsuit. I'd jump in the lake. I'd go for a swim. And I'd get out. And I just realized that, like, now I got in my car. And I kind of, I can, I could lollygag if I wanted. I could just move slow. And that's beautiful. That's freedom. But what I was, but there was just a small glimpse of like the structure, the imposed structure that was comforting somehow. This is some, this is some beta stuff. One could say, but it's not even that it's like also like the sobriety like now I, I'd been sober from everything, alcohol, cannabis, everything. Some people are saying there's, there's like, you can take LSD and that, and that won't test. I didn't mess with it. I just dedicated this time to be sober and I was sober for 130 days or something. Cause I was doing it for a month before I started, before I started the house arrest. Cause I knew I had to take a urine test immediately upon entry. So I was sober for like, since February. And the first day I was off the ankle bracelet, I of course wanted to celebrate. So I went out with some coworkers and we, we drank. Uh, I'm like, I'm just going to drink beer because I'm going to ease back into this. And, you know, people bought me shots. I was the oldest person in a bar. I'm like, what, who am I? It's like, who am I? You know, just being in a bar, being the oldest person probably by eight years. Not. Yeah. Yeah. It was like 21 to 27 year olds tops 27. I'm saying 21 to 24 primarily. And it's just so crowded. Can't talk to anyone music so loud it's like what am who am i i didn't get too drunk or anything but the next morning i paid for it it's like ugh. woke up slow depleted no dopamine and in that moment in that moment of weakness i'm like kind of missed the sobriety already kind of missed the sobriety already but since then I have not gone back to that Stockholm syndrome place. I have not, I've not even considered that yesterday. I mean, just going out, it's summertime. It's summertime in a beautiful, beautiful place. I've swam in the lake like four times in the past two days. Just gone out there, gone to yoga classes. I re, I re made my membership to the gym. I've been pushing sled. Oh my God, the first workout back. I haven't been lifting weights. I haven't been lifting anything heavy. I've been, I've been doing pull-ups. I did sprints 90% of the days. In the 90 days, uh, that would be 81 days. I, I, I might have done it 85. I, know, I did sprints almost every single day. And my sprint routine was 
five rounds of 50 yards, three to five rounds of 50 yards backwards, and then th- two to three hundred yard sprints. And I did that every single day, and some days I did it twice. I do a morning session, afternoon session. I did trampoline work. I did ten back hand, five to ten back hand springs, five to ten back flips. I do back hand springs to front flips. Um, I jump and make a what is it, a straddle with my legs. That cheerleading move. So I did the sprints. I did the trampoline. I did some calisthenics, pull ups, push ups, and uh, I had like a set of weights up to twenty two pounds or whatever. So I do curls, but first time back in the gym, pushing weight, I used to push the sled. I think it's 35 yard track. I would do a nonstop pull, push, pull, push, pull, push five at three plates. That would be how I started. My legs almost gave out doing three with one plate. So I don't know what that was. I'm like, is that there might be more friction? The sled might need a greasing or something, because or I've just after three months off, I feel that much weaker, which is which was a touch dis- discouraging, but it also felt so good to push weight again. The serotonin, the dopamine, or whatever the the rush from pushing weight, lifting heavy. I did like bench. I did all the classic workouts, basically, uh, some squat, some bench, um, like lat pull down, heavy lat pull down, cable fly, like all the the broy, all the bro moves. I did them with with real weight, and I just my body felt so good holding weight again, and uh, but weak significantly weaker after just 90 days of, of not pushing weight and just doing calisthenics. So I hope it was uh, beneficial somehow. I think it was. I think it's beneficial to take those long breaks from everything. I've been lifting weights for since I was 15, 13, so for 20 years, and really haven't taken any breaks from lifting weights. So to take that 90 days, we'll call it good. We'll call it a good thing. Call it a good thing to do the calisthenics and then to come back. Because we have no other option. Hero's journey. So I'm free now. I'm free and single and ready to for pussy. And the touch of a loved one. A touch of a liked one. I'll settle for a touch of a liked one. So Stockholm syndrome, I get it. I have this, I have this, I don't know if it's a disease. It's just like mental condition where I just can get it. It sounds like if you stopped it right here, this sounds awful. But I have a condition where I can just understand even the worst of things, even the worst, worst things of humanity. I can just be like, Oh, okay. And it, and it takes me seconds, not minutes, not days. I don't have to spend my time processing. You know, there's always these people that are like, I just don't understand. They hear some bad news. I just don't understand. I don't get it. I don't understand how that's possible. How could that CEO take millions and millions of dollars? How could these government officials siphon billions and billions of dollars of taxpayer money and put it into i just don't understand how could these generals sacrifice the lives of men to save their aircraft carrier their billion dollar aircraft carrier i just don't understand Stand and you know, and I'm sitting over here like I get it. How could that man murder 30 annoying bitches? I just don't get it. That's what they say. I'm like, I get it. 
You're asking me to cut, get murder. It's like, I get it. Now, obvious and necessary caveat, not going to do it. I got more control over myself. Now, I'm not, I don't know how life's going to unfold. Is there a cir- circumstance where, yeah, but that, you know, I'll have to kill someone? Oh, geez. Probably not. Probably. Don't know. But do I get it? Have I killed anyone? No. But do I get what it would take to do that? Training jujitsu for six years? So, no, right? Even though it's a simulated murder situation, get it a little bit, just a touch, just the tip. Do I get the anger that would be required to exact that kind of harm on someone? Get it. Come on. This is a terrible thing to say on a public <laughs> on a public show. And if you're going to clip it, well, I'll have some explaining to do. If you're just going to cl- clip this up, but you're not. We're family. But like the empathy required, people people are fronting basically. They're just like, I don't get it. No, you're not letting yourself feel your entire humanness. You know, because to be human and to be a man, especially speaking from the perspective of a identifying male, like to understand war, to understand how, like you don't understand something that's literally as old as time, as old as Cain and Abel, <laughs> way before that. Men have killed men since the beginning. Life kills life. Life eats life. And animals kill animals. So you don't get it. You're not trying. Or you just want to appear holier than thou. To say you don't understand things like murder, you don't understand things like theft, you don't understand like things like sexual fucking misconduct or pro like like you don't get like just say nothing you you saying you don't get it you get it you get it i don't understand i just don't get how they could sell a virus make everyone terrified Manipulate cat the manipulate the economy to get rid of cash <laughs> to get us all on a s- fucking digital currency that can be highly taxed and highly monitored to the cent. I just don't get how they can do that. I just don't get how they can sell a disease and propagate fear to make people stay inside and feel isolated and and dislike each other and be afraid of of human connection. I just don't understand. I don't understand how people can divide and conquer. It's like, and you're not trying. You're not trying. Not that, like, and here's the thing. Why try, right? Why try to understand? Because when you don't understand, when you don't try to understand and you feel completely separate from it, then you are a victim. You're in a victim mindset. When you don't try to understand, when you don't see yourself as part of the problem, you'll never be part of the solution. That's it. When you don't see yourself as part of the problem, you'll never, ever, ever be part of the solution. So to say you don't understand is just bypassing any sort of responsibility. It's claiming innocence. And what's the problem with claiming innocence? What's the price of innocence? It's impotence. It's ignorance. To, cl- to focus on claiming your innocence is to choose to be impotent. And it's a victim me- mentality. So to say, th- think the worst things, priests being pedophiles. I just don't understand. I do not understand how a man who, with all the biological imperatives to reproduce is told that they can't and that comes up as sexual misconduct, that that powerlessness that they feel for not being able to experience one of the, one of the things that it means to be human, they're denied it. 
And they choose it, right? It's not justifying these things. I'm never, I'm not justifying any of these misconducts, any of these sins, any of these bad things. It's not about that. It's about understanding it at a basic level, understanding these biological imperatives that create the animal, that create the beast, that the monster inside of us all. It's understanding that so it can be tamed. A monster that goes unchecked like ends up fucking being Godzilla and taking out all of Tokyo. All of New York in the Matthew, Bro- Matthew Broderick version. Jordan Peterson says talks about this all the time. You have to be the monster. You have to understand the monster inside of you so you can choose to not be it. Ha- it's best to be a warrior in a garden than a gardener in a war. It's like you have to look at these shadow parts. You have to look at these dark, terrible parts of yourself so you can transmute it. Because also when you when I've looked at these parts of myself, it's not so scary. The scariest things, it's usually that anger, whatever, ang- the root of anger is sadness. And that's true. I look at these scary, scary parts of myself, these parts that can see violence, that can like, like, yeah, like the powerful beast, like, I wouldn't even say powerful. It's like a lowercase p powerful, but these beastly parts of myself, the ones that can exact violence, the strength that I have, I, I've look at them closely and that insecurity is really rooted, rooted in a sadness or a disappointment in myself. And then once I can look at that, it's usually a bit of crying and then it's transmuted into something powerful. It's transmuted into something powerful, capital P. Powerful that can create, can build, that is proud to be myself, that is proud of, yeah, proud of myself. The part, it turns into a part that I can hug and embrace even within my own psyche. I just don't understand. Hey, shut up. Hey, how about that? How about sit in a sit still? If there's something that's really, really weighing on you, like this, like abortion, right? It's Roe versus Wade. I guess I'll give my take. I'll give my take at the end, but it's like, you know, we see these. I I think this the victim mentality is really the. Fuck, it's, it's the hardest part. And a, and a symptom of, of the victim mentality is this is blame. So you that's how you know you're hearing it for sure, for sure. When someone is blaming some something outside themselves instead of responsibility. It's like even the little things. Like someone's late, what do they say? It was traffic, right? Or I was stuck in the meeting. You're stuck. How often do you hear someone say like, uh, I chose to leave a little bit later than I should have. That's what they mean by traffic. That's what someone really means by traffic. I chose to leave later than I, than I should have to be on time. I chose to stay in this meeting instead of coming to the next one. I chose to not respond. This is how, uh, to be fully vulnerable, I've looked in, at this victim a lot and I've noticed where does this, where is it still holding on in me? And I feel powerless a lot of times when I, uh, when people don't call me back. You know, all this connection that we have with our cell phones, there's a million ways to get a hold of people and yet some people just aren't avail like they aren't available to return your call. I guess some people give you your their number with no expectation of like returning your call. <laughs> no expectation of doing business. I've talked about this in previous podcasts, but that's that's where I'm still I'm still feel a little victimized. I noticed is in relations to others and um wanting it to be different. And so I'll blame or I'll get angry at these people. It's like they can't call me back. I'm it's it's and 
some of it feels justified. It's like I had a twenty thousand dollar contract that I was going to give this contractor. You don't want to call back? Are you sure? Like, it makes me upset. How do, how is it going to make me upset? It's like, it, but it does. That's where I still I still have a little bit of this victim um, mentality. I take a large amount of responsibility, uh, even for things like this house arrest. Um, you know, showing up. You can listen back to the last episode. The responsibility of, um, and responsibility meaning I'm not to blame. I'm not blaming myself. It's not about turning the blame inward. It's literally your ability to respond to that which arises. Like there is, like getting cancer. I'm not, there, there used to be a time where I, I thought, There was, a, there was a thought pattern I used to have where I thought, <laughs> okay, when when you realize you're one, you're, when, when I realized I'm one, I'm connected with everything that's around me. There was a time where I took responsibility for everything as if it was my fault, as if I was completely responsible, meaning I was the cause of everything that's unfolding. And that's actually narcissistic. That's actually over making myself over important and thinking that I'm completely responsible for the world. That's not giving others enough credit. That's not giving others enough divinity, enough godliness. It's this Christ complex thing that can happen after you have like a revelation, after you kind of realize your connectedness with the whole, you can feel this it can it can manifest into this egoic formation of I am so important, and you are important. But this it's it crosses a line where it's like I am responsible for everything, meaning I am to blame for everything, and that's not necessary. That's not true. I'm not responsible for. I'm not the cause of everything that arises, but my ability to respond to what arises is my power. That's my response ability. My ability to respond to what arises. So cancer, there was a long time. It's like, how did I create this? How did I manifest this into my life? Like that's, it's the manifest, it's the manifestors. It's everything's karma, you know, and past life regression and stuff. And all this is fine to talk about, but there's just no, you know, there's no proof. There's no, there's no overwhelming feeling that this is the truth. Like, I'm not discrediting it. I'm just not overly crediting it. And things just arrive. There is a certain level of randomness in the universe. It doesn't have to be all randomness or all order. That's when people tend to fall into these buckets. It's like everything happens for a reason, all order. And then there's other people. It's like everything is just random. It's just a mess of chemicals. And and it's that's nihilism. That's purposelessness. And it's both. There's chaos and order. There's randomness and sequence and i have a partial blame responsibility for the things of creating the cancer in my but no i wasn't fully responsible there was proclivity there was propensity there was dna there was things that preceded me that contributed to it stuff that i couldn't necessarily control a certain amount of randomness random mutation leading to a cancer cell creating more of itself and but my ability to respond to that to get healthy again um, is is the important part. That's the power, and that's the shift. That's the shift. The victim, because you can be victim to yourself. You can start if you're not blaming others. Maybe it's a step in the process towards responsibility. Is I blaming others? I realize that's not the way. That that's just creating more mess. So. I decided to take responsibility, but that looks like blaming myself. So now I blame myself for everything and that creates guilt and that's creating more of the mess. It's not there either. So the focus has to be on my ability to respond to that, which occurs giving honor to both the chaos and the order, the nature and the nurture.
response ability, ability to respond. <clears throat> but I think this one like thesis or whatever, shifting away from the victim mentality, shifting into really a creator or a co-creator, a contributor, a participant, a player in the game. Like that is so huge. And for whatever reason, now let's see if I'm going to do the victim thing or if I can, you know, be a contributor. I noticed a lot of the interactions I'm having, or maybe just some, people are telling me their woes and their woes are outside of them. They're using the, they did that, he did that, she did that, the government, oh yeah, abortion. I mean, people are really, really upset about abortion and it is a hyperinflated topic and there's a lot to cover and I won't cover it for too long. But blaming the government, you know, blaming the systems. And there are things out of your control. But your ability, your your response to these things. Seeing yourself as part of the problem will be the only way to be part of the solution. So it's all these old white men and women, white white men that are creating these laws, what the fuck do they know? Okay, that's true. So how are you contributing to that? How are you contributing to... And look, I don't know. I, my take on abortion is is this. I think it's important to clear. I've thought about this a lot. I've helped others uh, go through their abortion. And... Uh, Everything in my, like, I don't know, manifesto or, like, uh, virtues is the freedom of choice is so important. People have to be given autonomy. Or not given, but people have this sovereign right to autonomy to make choices for themselves. To choose what they do with their body. And all of this is is even, the prelude to all this is... This is completely a woman's issue. We're getting so concerned with where to draw the line that we're forgetting who should draw the line in the first place. And it's women. And giving the choice to the women is very, very important. Giving the choice to individual women, to individuals, and to women in this particular case is the utmost importance. That will be the thing that I, that I fight for now. I have a slightly different take as well. It's not; ju- it just doesn't end there, because after getting sick, I realized, and maybe before, but after getting sick, I really realized, and being faced with death, I realized how beautiful and precious life is. Life is so precious. Life needs to be celebrated. Life needs to be revered and to be honored. And although women's choice has to be an imperative it ha- in my opinion it has to be coupled with the complete understanding and reverence for life it must be life is is so beautiful there's so much beauty in it and beauty needs to be protected and it needs to be honored and you can see in this way just in that in that and that phrase where the right side is coming from the right wing side is coming from because they see life is so precious and even if they don't manifest it this way even though if if it looks like power and control and manipulation which some of it is the root the seed is like life is so beautiful life is precious it needs to be protected and revered and then they're going about it in all the wrong ways of of using fear to propagate that virtue any virtue that is acted upon in the name of virtue is no longer virtue this is the teaching of the Tao Te Ching virtue which is virtuous is no longer virtue so it's you're not protecting life by demanding it or creating a fear model to support it 
you're protecting life when you're giving the living a choice in their life. And then you're showing them through love and through honoring your own life and through honoring the life around you. So choice is the imperative. But it needs to be coupled with the beauty of life. I think I think those who are just about abortion, who are so... It's, it's a sovereign right. It's like a it's you know they're they're just screaming at the right side using all of these extreme and that's the thing too extreme examples are an immediate turnoff for me they people think that you by using extreme examples they're pulling people to their side it's the exact opposite they are grounding people in their stance and maybe even pushing them further away so using the extreme examples of, of rape, are these terrible examples, right, that no one can understand. How can anyone rape anyone? How can anyone, like, have incest, you know? The worst fucking things possible that I would never do, ever. And, of course, that no one can understand how they happen. And using these extreme examples just do the opposite it's like what's the most what are abortions being used for primarily let's talk from the center you know let's talk from the biggest the most the biggest the the most likely case scenario so life is precious life is beautiful life in my opinion can be revered not should but like when i'm true when i'm feeling true and authentic and like connected to myself i have an immense gratitude for life i have an immense admiration for even the smallest forms of life of the seed and the garden the seed that grows into the garden and uh respect and admiration for women which deserve the the right to make the choices for themselves. It is from this freedom of choice that we're celebrating life by giving those who are living the power, empowering the individual with personal freedom, with autonomy, with choice. That is a celebration of life. And then coupling that with, I don't know, I'd say education, but that's too broad. It's just like, fuck, fuck, it's heavy. You know, I've been through a perspective of abortion. It's like part of me that, well, You know, I'd have a I'd have a child right now, and that's some days I yeah I wish I wish I fought a little bit harder I guess not fought but like just thought a little bit more about how beautiful it would be to have a son or daughter right now. You know, that would have been a complete life changer. It'd be so beautiful in a lot of ways. But alas, I, you know, I chose to not fight that fight. I chose to, uh, well, yeah, I chose and I also just didn't know. I didn't have the same perspective I have now. And it probably wasn't the right time. And really I gave the woman the choice and that's what they chose and I stick by that. You know, I support them in that choice. Yeah, it's just, it's, it's, it's so both, you know, and that's the point. It's so both and that's the point. And that's why I don't want to hear anyone say they don't understand how terrible things happen in the world. <laughs> it's just, that's just you not knowing yourself. That's just you not taking the time to sit down and see the demons that exist in yourself. That's what I see. When I hear someone say they don't understand, it's like, you're just not taking the time. 
I mean, there are atrocious things that have happened in this world. But, like, I've, I've never had extreme power. But I can understand how extreme power creates extreme insecurity. And how from that place of insecurity, terrible, terrible things can be justified. Vlad the Impaler. Dracula. The inspiration for Dracula. Like, maybe this isn't the place to talk about all those terrible things, but I guess that, that might be bypassing. It's like, I could see how a dictator can feel insecure, and I can see how that insecurity would cause them to create, use fear to hold on, to grip into what into the power they think they have and how terrible, terrible things can be justified in that. I can see how someone would value this, their shareholders or value the bottom line over, over life, over human life, over the natural world and how decisions can be made to prioritize money and ego i could see how someone who's been hurt or someone that's been rejected by someone of the opposite sex someone that's been frustrated and had no connection and had no parents to love them or tell them that they're okay or that they're enough people that have been bullied can go out and hurt people can go out and rape and go out and create dysfunction and let their hurt spill over into other people. Like, I can see that. I can see how someone can make me angry enough to want to end them. I can see it. And you can too. And don't you don't have to live in that space. You don't have to dwell on that space. But having cultivating the empathy and the understanding gives you the opportunity, gives us the opportunity to heal gives us the opportunity to be, to be part of the solution. And what can be more important? Oh. I thought this was going to be a funny one. But, uh, alas, I do feel different. And, uh, I hope this gave you something to think about. I hope this gave you a small, you know, a lot of people are hard on themselves. A lot of people point that blame. At least I did. I've pointed that blame at myself way more times than I've pointed at other people. In fact, I've let people walk all over me and I've taken responsibility where it wasn't necessary. I've talked about that previously in the show and And those are, the, those are the people I want to talk to the most, those who blame themselves, those who fall, feel victim to their circumstances or victim to you know their own judgment. And that's not the way either. That's just one. That's, it seems to be one step away from the responsibility that will bring true self-worth, confidence, and love, you know, love for who you are and how far you've come. And I love you. And I thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. And I uh, hope to talk to you. Some, some of you in the comments or in the social media space. And this has been the good wind.